Hi, this is Anthony P. Ferrante, director of the Sharknado Quadrilogy, and I'm you're listening to uh, Without Your Head. Well, welcome to the station of decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neal, and I'm joined by uh, Evie Barrett of Stand Against Evil, the voice of Korra on The Legend of Korra, Becca of You're the Worst, and not to be weird, but according to IMDb, she's exactly three days older than me, Janet Varney. Ah, happy birthday to us all, but not anywhere yeah. near right now. Right, 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 yeah. yeah. It was interesting. <laughs> the same year, just three days apart. So. Right! <laughs> if IMDb is correct. Yeah, I was going to say, I guess that makes you an Aquarius, right, or a Pisces. Pisces. It doesn't really matter. Pisces. Is, uh-huh. Yeah, my, mm-hmm. well, it's very strange, because it's right on the cusp of my birthday, the 19th, yeah. and, and uh, on some of them it's an Aquarius, but it's usually Pisces. Yeah. You can take your pick. Whatever you, whatever you feel like works best for you, go ahead and just claim right. it. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> we're not here. To, we're not here to talk about Pisces and Aquarius. I don't think. But uh, so, uh, first of all, like, uh, how did you get involved in Stand Against Evil? Uh, well, I have been friends with Dana for many years now, and um, he was when he was working on the script for Stan. He actually told me, you know, I, I came up with this character um and i and it's you and i said great i can't wait for someone else to end up getting cast because that is usually what happens when someone writes something for someone else <laughs> like at the last minute uh-huh. someone will go wait a minute could we get someone more famous or like you know i know that your brain as a writer is important but uh also we have thoughts so i was fully expecting uh it to not work out the way that it did, but um, I can very happily say that uh, that ISC agreed with Dana, and uh, and so I was able to take on the role of Evie, which was just a total blast. Um, but it was definitely, you know, it's, 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 it was really flattering and very exciting to have someone kind of have, you know, their, their idea of you in their brain and, and kind of mm-hmm. imagine you executing something in a certain way, but it's also a little intimidating because it feels like there's almost you put extra pressure on yourself to want to <laughs> make sure that, you know, his idea of what you're capable of uh, matches up with what you can actually do. So right. uh, luckily I think it all, it all panned out and, uh, and it was just a blast uh, to work on that show. Hard work, but so, so, so worth mm-hmm. it. So since it was uh, written with you in mind, when you first uh, read this, the first script or about the character, uh, did you like the character right away? And did you think, oh, yeah, this is something I can do? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I really like a good uh, dry delivery. Um, I love mm-hmm. that Evie was strong, um, but, you know, still, like, had funny lines and found herself trapped in crazy situations. And uh, the whole the whole sort of way that Dana had framed the character and uh, and, and the way that she kind of reacts to stuff, I felt like was very much within my wheelhouse. And it was exciting. You know, what, one of the things that's uh, been consistent, I think, about a lot of the, the stuff I've done um, has been that, you know, sometimes the hero roles uh, are not, as dynamic and certainly I, my character is the least crazy of the main four cast members of the show. But, uh, but I felt like I got to still do a ton and, and be a part of a bunch of really funny stuff. So, um, sorry, I'm just going to make sure that I don't forget that. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I, I, sometimes playing the villain is more fun because that's like where the comedy is or that's where the, sort of more interesting characters live and and that's definitely something I absolutely love doing but it's also so great to get the chance to play characters like Cora and Evie who are you know kind of the the glue of the show on on some level and who are tasked with you know uh, protecting or saving or you know learning hard lessons along the way um, but still get to be funny and dynamic so I feel really lucky that uh, that I got to do that. Yeah. How about roles that you write for yourself? Do you uh, do you tend to write yourself as a villain then, since uh, since it's more fun? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think that like the character of me who has my name uh, in Fortune Rookie is um, definitely a more of a jerk version of me. Uh, I don't. I, she's you know, and, it, and, it, and you're absolutely right. You hit the nail on the head. It was more fun to put to imagine her 
you know, being kind of clueless about certain things or having her values uh, be a little more plastic on some level than, than what mine are and her self-importance uh, or, or at least narcissism be, um, you know, sort of at least like self-obsession be uh, a little more developed in mind. And that's exactly right. It's, it's really fun to play messy um, characters to make bad choices. Yeah. Before we get into the show, I had a question uh, along those lines. Do you think having so many different uh, places uh, for shows today, like, uh, you know, uh, streaming sites and, and, uh, and basic cable and, and cable, that you can have characters like that? Because it kind of seems in the last 20 years or so, like the anti-hero and not necessarily like really likable characters uh, have shows now. Because it used to be like you'd have to be like the character, the main character was like really goody goody. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's something to be said for our evolution of understanding the the kind of imperfections of humanity and the sort of dark and light sides of all different kinds of characters, and that we enjoy. I mean, I think we people have always enjoyed watching the villain, but and and oftentimes you know, people walk away feeling like they, that was their favorite part, uh, even with, mm-hmm. you know, Shakespeare and so forth. But you're right, the lines are, are much more clearly drawn. And certainly in American television, um, I completely agree with you for, you know, so much of, of what we've seen. Uh, and I'm just specifying television since that's kind of what we were talking about with Stand Against mm-hmm. Evil, but also in movies. Um, you do kind of see this evolution of, oh, wait, it's, really interesting to watch somebody who may be doing something that on its surface, I would just, if I didn't know anything else, I would just dismiss as wrong, or I would just dismiss as evil. But here we have this opportunity to have our own morals and ethics uh, challenged because, you know, we're, we're, we start to side with the person we see the most because we understand their motivations better. And, you know, that's, where we have all these these great shows that people love, like Breaking Bad, and I'm actually rewatching The Shield uh, for the first time well, in many, many years, yeah. and uh, and 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 just you know loving it, and just uh, remembering you know afresh how how great of a job they do, really testing your loyalty to Vic, you know Vic's character, and uh-huh. and really all of the characters on the show. You get to see where everyone's like all their buttons that get pushed, and you get to see kind of where they're um, where they are the most tested morally, you know, and yeah. uh, and it's just great. It's just great. Yeah, the, the the first episode of that show really sets him off as like a villain. Oh, He's doing some bad things. I know things. you're like, how am I ever going to get over him <laughs> shooting this guy? I spoiler yeah. alert: it is in the first right. episode, and it's a very old show. But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and then what? Uh, one of the best uh, final episodes I think of any series. It's like the very dramatic, very very heartbreaking. The, the final episode, and then it's left. Well, o- you know what? It's been so long since I watched the whole thing. I can't. Yeah, it's been so long since right. I watched the whole thing. Don't tell me because I I seriously I don't I remember. <laughs> like I just right. got into season four, and I'm like, oh, oh Glenn Close. That's right. Oh, that's right. I yeah. completely <laughs> forgot. Yeah. So uh, clearly, my <laughs> mind has has blanked out a bunch of it. But yeah. Yeah. So uh, what is Fortune Rookie for people not aware? So Fortune Rookie is is another IFC venture uh, that I did. It's online, um, and it is uh, just a totally kooky story of, you know, an alternate reality version of me who is told by uh, ostensibly a psychic that I myself have the gift. And so I decide to use it as an opportunity to quit show business and become a fortune teller with very little skill and zero experience. Um, and so you just sort of see me interacting. The first episode is, um, starts with me trying to give a palm reading to Fred Armisen and it just does not go well at all. Um, and so it sort of uh, keeps going from there. Uh, but one of the kind of recurring themes on the show is that James Roday, who was the star, one of the stars of Psych, um, is a friend of mine and he finds out that I have quit my job to become a psychic and he gets really angry and, and thinks that I'm stealing his thunder somehow. Like I'm horning in on his business and his sort of like personality identity. So he sort of plays my nemesis in the show and it's really funny. Yeah. 
So what's the inspiration for this? Do you have like a, uh, a background or like an experience with like a medium or anything? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I was one of those kids who desperately wanted to have ESP. You know, I wanted to be able to have telekinesis. Um, I just want, you know, I was totally the person like who saw Ghostbusters and was like, Oh, I, listen, put some, ca- hold up some cards. I'll be able to guess what they are. I'm pretty sure I have powers. Uh, and when that did not pan out, um, I continued to, to like hang on to this hope that perhaps some version of that is real in the world. Um, but I was also, but also I have such a healthy dose of cynicism that I never tested that. I always thought, well, if somebody is marketing themselves as a psychic, clearly they're not like somehow I just thought there's no way that you could be legitimate or I don't, maybe you are legitimate, but I don't want to take that chance and find out that you're not <laughs> and then have my, the other half of me be crushed because I de- so desperately want it to be a real thing. Uh, so mm-hmm. it took a long, you know, I, I didn't even see anyone or do anything like that until a few years ago when a friend of mine here had this, you know, what uh, seems to be a very extraordinary experience that she was, she truly was like, you know, all of these things came true and she was able to kind of laundry list them out. And she was like, you've got to go, you've got to go see this guy. And so I went and saw him and I, and suffice it to say, I did not have that experience, but mm-hmm. I became so fascinated with the idea of, you know, first of all, Los Angeles being a perfect city for stuff like that, because, you know, you have people who come here who are, um, whether they, what, you know, like, for example, I hate gambling, but I clearly mm-hmm. must like some level of gambling because I, you know, I came to a city where it's, it's you it's it's a numbers game as much as it is anything else you know you're really banking on this sort of chance that something is going to happen for you so you know it's really a perfect and it's full of people who are insecure and egotistical so it's a great rich fertile ground for a psychic and uh and i and and then, and then i just couldn't get over the fact that even though i didn't feel like he hit on a lot uh, at all, I was so trying to shape whatever I was experiencing and like make it fit that mold. And then I started kind of obsessing over this idea that people would go see that people go see someone and then they sh- change their future to try to fit what mm. some stranger told them was going to happen. So I, I, that's been on my mind for for years, and and I've kind of been working on different iterations of the show, whether it be like a half hour sitcom or. Uh, sort of more of a daily show type thing where I'm actually out in the world interviewing so-called psychics. Uh, and then this <laughs> this version made the most sense for IFC because it kind of does have that P- Portlandia kind of magical realism. And it's mm-hmm. very much making fun of the city um, and goes very dark. But at the same time, it's clear that I do have like a lot of love for Los Angeles. Um, mm-hmm. so that's, that's the version that we ended up making and I, and I just love it. I, I, I'm so proud of it and I'm so proud of the people who worked on it. And, um, I find it to be just a, de- a delightful hoot of the show. Mm-hmm. Have you had any feedback from anyone in that world, like, uh, mediums or anybody, uh, associated with that? I have about not, the sir. Oh. I wonder, yeah, I, I, I'm very curious. I wonder, I mean, I think they would probably just say, you know, this, this, what you're doing is preposterous and it's not, you know, and it's a science and an art and all this stuff. I think probably it would be very easy as a person working as a psychic to dismiss uh, what I'm doing. It's just, you know, it's kind of silly, <laughs> but, uh, right. but I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. So uh, which part of the creative process do you enjoy the most? Is it, this a show you created and wrote and you're performing in? Or uh, is it kind of all the same? Um, it's it, it, it's it's varying levels. It's sort of like a, oh boy, I've never made this comparison before. It's probably gonna fall flat on its face, but um, you know, it's it's kind of like eating a meal where you're sort of like, oh, I I've loved this first course, and you know, I've this second course mm-hmm. is delicious but totally different, and then there's dessert, and you know, I wouldn't want to skip dessert because I have a sweet tooth, but I wouldn't want to eat dessert first, you know, so it's sort of is kind of it does feel like it has it's like you don't want to choose because they're also different from one another the different phases of production um that being said it's really hard to beat actually being on set and you know hearing for example when i i sent you know when i sent james his script and then you know he came in and we started shooting them and he was saying the words that i had heard him saying in my head 
Uh, and then we improvised, you know, off of that stuff as well, just for some like bonus takes and whatnot. And it was so much better than I could have ever imagined that I just felt high. So I've now learned that, you know, being able to write for your friends and watch them, you know, make magic um, from something that was in your dumb brain uh, it is like one of the most delightful experiences of my life. And I, I hope yeah. I get to do it more because yeah, it's so, so that energy, those moments of those things jumping off the page and coming to life in someone else's mouth <laughs> are, are really, really <laughs> exciting. So if I had to pick, I'd say probably those, those moments. All right. I think that analogy made sense. This is like oh, uh, your favorite part of the meal. Isn't like a side of peas, but, but it's still part of yeah. the, the whole meal. Right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Gosh, if it's if yeah. someone's favorite part of the meal is a side of peas, we might have to have a talk. <laughs> right, right. So I saw <laughs> videos of you playing Magic the Gathering and uh, and um, and some board game. Oh board yeah. Game. Uh, are th- are those things you're into? Uh, no. Now uh, uh, <laughs> that being <okay>. said, <laughs> that being said, uh, it's only by lack of it's you know I just didn't grow up in a community of people like I had. I knew people who played D and D and stuff when I was younger and no one ever asked me to, no one ever said, you know, you should come over and play with us. I thought that it was some elite thing that, you know, I wasn't worthy of as as I I really did. I was like, Oh, this is a secret thing that I'm just not, I can't have any part in. This is something that some some elite group of people knows the, all the secrets to. So, um, so it wasn't something that I, that I grew up doing and, uh, and, and no one asked me to play or do anything like that until m- much more recently. But then, you know, everybody else knew already how to play all, all, all the stuff, all the RPGs and stuff. And I didn't. So, um, I really have to have my hand held, but, you know, like for example, doing spell slingers was so much fun. And, uh, and I, and I definitely learned a lot doing that and, and, and doing tabletop of will and, you know, anything like that, I'm always yeah. game to show up for. And, and what's been, I think really fun about this podcast that I'm doing now called Voyage to the Stars that I'm doing with Felicia Day and, and Colton Dunn and Steve Berg, who are all big gamers is, kind of finally drawing a connection between improv and RPGs, realizing like, oh, like we're creating a a space world with a structure. We sort of have a a dungeon master, Mm -hmm. if you will, who's Ryan Koppel, who created the show, who's giving, who has an outline and has this end goal in mind, but we're fabricating all of the details and the richness and the texture and the dialogue and all of the stuff that's happening in this world. And obviously it's not on a set, so there's nothing visual uh, to it yet. It's all audio Mm -hmm. uh, and sort of talking and fabricating stories with your friends. And at a certain point I was like, Oh, Oh, I see. We're playing D D and D like that's essentially what it is. (laughs) You know, you're essentially improvising with your friends in, in game form. And had someone just Uh told me that when I was a kid, I would have been like, let's do it. (laughs) That that sounds very interesting because I'm a, well, I haven't played in a long time, but grew up playing D and D since I was like six or something. My older brother is nine years older and he was the dungeon master. So I play with his friends up until probably into my twenties. So this sounds very interesting. Uh, I'd like to check this out. And it does yeah, help your there, and there imagination are some a lot. Podcasts. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll walk away from doing one of our episodes feeling like I really saw all of that stuff in my head, the stuff that we were talking about. And, you know, it's, it just, it's, it really is like, oh, I'm a kid. I'm a kid imagining stuff. And that's what, and that's my job. And that's ridiculous and awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so where will that podcast be? I guess on, uh, now. On, on everything iTunes. And, yeah, it's but, uh, out where there. do you find it's on everything or uh it's on everything. You can go to Apple Podcasts. Um you can just Google Voyage to the Stars and I guarantee you it will come up on any and all uh podcast platforms. And I think we have now uh released our ninth episode. It comes out every Tuesday. So one oh, came out cool. today. Yeah. Oh, very nice. So uh, uh which came first, the comedy or, or acting? Acting, thing, acting for me. Yeah. No, I mean, act, I mean, yeah, I would say the comedy was just in being a goofball kid. And then the acting was, um, actually stuff I kind of did in school and, and whatnot, but it took a long time for me to marry those two, uh, in any kind of real way, like doing sketch or improv. I didn't do until, um, my early twenties, I think like, yeah, my early twenties. And so, uh, so yeah, for the longest time, you know, I was just a kind of more of a theater 
kid, even though I was definitely, as I said, a total goofball. So what made you want to become an actor? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I genuinely don't know. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I've, I've always loved performing. Um, I, I am a very, very emotional person. Like many actors, I have a lot of empathy. Um, it is very painful to have as much empathy as I have sometimes. And I know that's like a gross thing to say, like, I just feel for other people too much. Uh, but, it, but it, but it is, um, hard to have lots of emotions all the time. And so I think I look at people who have the same condition that I do, who don't necessarily get to express it artistically in the same way I do. And I really feel for them because, you know, it is very cathartic uh, getting to perform and, and play other people and write and be around creative people and all that kind of stuff. And for me, comedy is, um, you know, it's just, it's just been such a fun, but also really important part of my life in terms of knowing that, you know, I'm making other people feel good and possibly forget about whatever's happening in the world that is much mm -hmm. more um, serious and, and austere and all that. And, uh, and it's been really good for me to laugh so much, right? just to be able to show up to a set and just laugh my ass off um, has been like medicine for me for, for a long time now. Mm -hmm. So when you started doing the improv, uh, do you think that helped you as an actor for dramatic roles? For sure. For sure. I think improv helps anybody do anything, honestly, even if you're not an actor, or even if you're not even in show business, taking an improv class. Uh, I think it does a number of different things. It makes you more confident speaking um, in weird situations, and uh, it makes you more comfortable uh, bonding and interacting with people you don't necessarily know very well because you kind of build an early trust with people if you're taking an improv class. And it, uh, and it, and it also um, teaches you to give yourself permission to fail in a way that I think a lot more people could use because we're, uh, so many of us are so hard on ourselves. And, uh, and taking improv reassures you that you have to be willing to flop spectacularly to learn and to get better and, and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, some people get a lot of that when they're younger or they, you know, they play sports that they're not immediately great at and they, they learn stuff that way. But, um, mm -hmm. but then there are others of us who, you know, I was just afraid of failing. And, and so I, I stayed away from stuff that I didn't think I would be good at uh, or, or, you know, I, I didn't want to take a lot of chances cause I didn't want, because as aforementioned, I'm very emotional. So as a kid who, would get so bummed out so quickly if I, if I felt like I was bad or I looked dumb or, you know, something like that, I would just feel like, Oh, well, I'm just not good at this. I'm terrible. So I, I shouldn't do it. And, and that's so stupid. You know, it's so stupid. It's like, give yourself a chance to be terrible and then find out what, what comes out of that. It might be something really beautiful and spectacular. If you, if you let that be a part of your process, you know, mm -hmm. interesting. So, uh, uh, is the San Francisco sketch fest, is that still going or did that, that end? It is. No, it's still going. It's, okay. uh, we're going into our 19th year and it'll be 19 years next, uh, next I meant, uh, I meant the actual is, uh, not that it ended completely, but is it happening still right now? Oh, sorry. No, it's definitely oh, done. Sorry. Yeah. It's just three weekend, three weeks in January. Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, so who was involved this year and how did that go? Who was involved this year? Um, let's see. Tons of great folks. Uh, let me think. We had a Best in Show reunion um, with Christopher Guest and the cast. We had Neil Patrick Harris and Margaret Cho um, in tributes uh, to them where they come and, you know, we sort of are in conversation with them. We did a bunch of stuff at a place called the Speakeasy where we kind of merged uh, interactive kind of theatrical stuff and comedy, which was really cool with um, people like Michael Lee and black and Bob Odenkirk and Dana came up. Um, a couple of my other castmates from Stan did stuff, Nate Mooney and Deborah Baker jr. And yeah, I mean, we have like, you know, a couple hundred shows uh, anywhere from an up and coming group from a college somewhere in the middle of the United States to you know, some of the stuff I just mentioned. So we have all these things, different venues of different sizes and everybody kind of gets together at the end of the night and, and goes to the same party. So it's really kind of, um, I think Fred Armisen called it 
he said it's like summer camp for comedians and we've uh-huh. held on to that because we're like yeah. oh yeah that's great and he's to my favorite people i love uh christopher guest and and all his movies oh. and uh as a huge, I always think uh, Mr. Show, that's my favorite sketch com, uh, comedy show ever. And it's really cool also to see Bob Odenkirk become such a, have such a, an iconic role now with, uh, with Saul. You know, I uh, know. Makes you happy. He sure doesn't take it for granted either. I've known Bob for years and it, it, he just, just continues to be sort of amazed and humbled that, that it worked out the way it did because he had this whole other kind of career before that, you know. And so uh, for him, I think it does feel like, you know, a dream come true a dream he may not have even know knew he had until it was happening you know right right so just real quick about uh stan uh versus evil now um it's horror comedy but uh and you know obviously like comedy Do you, are you a fan of horror movies at all or horror tv shows i i am yeah i uh i do like scary movies i um i'm not a huge fan of like just you know sort of or gore for the sake of gore, but I don't know that many people who are. I mean, people who are are so loud and proud about it, and then the rest of us uh-huh. are like, I mean, if it's really good, you know. Um, but uh, but I've I've a bit. That being said, you know, I think the sort of meta horror that has been coming out of places like Bloomhouse and so forth, mm-hmm. um, where you know, up and coming filmmakers are really given the opportunity to to show. Uh, some creative ideas that don't necessarily follow the usual rules of a horror movie um, have been really cool and interesting to see. And, you know, it's always interesting to see like horror movies from other countries and, and, and what, where they, where they line up and there's a similarity. And of course you don't know if that's from the influence of American cinema, but also Mm -hmm. the places that they diverge and, and, you know, uh, and I love horror comedy definitely uh, was a, yeah big fan of stuff like Shaun of the Dead and, and, um, uh, the, 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 oh God, there was, now I can't, house, housebound, housebound, um, mm. great Australian, very, very funny, very scary movie. Um, so yeah, for me, that's a really good combination because I, I like the relief of laughing and I like the relief of being startled and scared and, and freaked out. And when you can kind of put those two things together, that's a nice little high. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they work well together. Sometimes, uh, uh, they, well, just like anything, sometimes they don't, but, uh, a lot of the great, uh, horror comedy movies, in my opinion, the horror has to work well for the comedy to work well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And Bruce Campbell obviously is, is maintained, uh, sort of royalty in that department and, and for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. Return living did a lot of great, uh, horror comedies. Yeah, and uh, I know you worked with uh, you were on a uh, uh, Key and Peele and uh, Jordan Peele, obviously huge now in the horror world. So, uh, did you ever expect that? Did you know that he no. he was like uh, he was in the horror movies or he would be making them I, at some point? I didn't. I didn't, or if I did, I've forgotten. No, I, that was that was that's been so cool to see, and that's a great example of you know Jordan's a real um, a really great exciting example and an inspiration. Uh, for people who are in the comedy world and known for comedy, but who get the chance to stretch their wings and show, uh, and Dana too, you know, to be able to show um, their other passions and to kind of unite them and present them to the world. And, and, and you know, Jordan being a, a sterling example of that. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. So where can people find Fortune Rookie? Uh, they can find it at fortunerookie.net. They can find it on YouTube. They can uh, look for it on the IFC site. Um, it's out there. Mm-hmm. So it's easy to find. And how about uh, if people, would, how can people follow you? Which sounds weird, but I follow you online, not like <laughs> your house. Yeah, fair enough. Um, uh-huh. right. I mean, it is a horror podcast. Or your house. Uh, if no, you, if they you did, tell yeah, me yeah. Tell I'll tell you what. We'll start with online and we'll see how it goes. All right, um, okay. I, I'm at Janet Varney on Twitter and uh, the JV Club on Instagram. And then my website, JanetVarney.com, exists, uh, has lots of helpful links on it, and needs to be updated with more uh, news and upcoming events. Yeah. It is weird how obviously we have the website, but it is weird. The last uh, five years or so, it really is more social media uh, than actual, you know, websites. 
Yeah, it's handy when you have I, my designer built in my my Twitter feed, so you can sort of pretend like you're staying updated on everything because that's just like the window exists there that's that's more current. Uh huh. Very cool. Well, I I appreciate coming on. I love fun talking with you. My pleasure, Neil. Great talking to you as well. Very good. Good. All right. Well, I'm going to check out our Fortune Rookie. I uh, you sold me on Please it. Sounds very fun. I think you'll like it. I think you'll like it. It's it's a very painless experience, and you can walk away from the entire series having given up about an hour of your time. And I think it's an hour uh, that flies by. All right, all right very good. That's always nice. a good selling point. It's a painless experience. Yeah, I know it's very painless. I mean, unless you uh-huh. want to inflict pain on yourself, but that's really your business. All right. Yeah. Well. Yeah. They call they call me nasty Neil for reasons. So. Well, there you go. Enjoy it, however <laughs> that means to you. Right. All right. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> cool. All right, Neil. Thanks so much. Thanks. Take care. Take care. Hey, this is Alan Troutman, and you are listening to WithoutYourHead.com. I don't know how you can listen without your head, but there you are.